Hi, everyone, and welcome to Proving Grounds. Uh, first off, uh, I'd like to thank our sponsors. And please visit them in the chill out room, especially uh, Verisprite, Veris Tenable, Amazon, and Source of Knowledge. So today we're, we're having a talk on Intro to Storage System Security by Jarrett Cohn. Uh, please join me in welcoming, welcoming Jarrett. Good morning. I'm Jarrett. Uh, some of you might know me from Twitter or IRC, very active on Freenode. I work for a company called High Availability Inc. We were formerly known as HA Storage Systems. Uh, I have about 20 years of industry experience from everything, uh, from small business, enterprise, and national defense. So when I was younger, I really got into security simply from Star Wars, seeing how poorly a giant empire did things. So you'll see a lot of references to that in here. And I just want to give a shout out to my boss, Steve, who's watching this on the stream, because I'm expensing a lot of stuff this week, and he needs kudos. So why should we care about storage security? Well, your data is the lifeblood of your company, and data loss and disasters cost us $1.7 trillion annually. Few companies actually have staff properly trained on the storage systems that they use. And you'd think that companies would put a little bit more effort into what they actually have on site or what they might be going to in the cloud. And we're fighting a losing battle. Like the only way to win is not to play, but it, it's certainly not that simple. And the best thing we can do, once again, is to equip ourselves with the knowledge of how all these products work. So who here has actually gone to a class on their storage that they might have at their companies or customers? What about a storage-based class with security, like a security-focused class? Two people in this group, and that's actually pretty high. Uh, a few have, and when you think that vendors, they might have four or five different product lines, different types of disk arrays, each of these with different things to learn. They might be running different operating systems even. Some disk arrays run four or five different operating systems for different functions within it. The knowledge gap between you and the hackers is their best advantage. And what does it mean for you? Well, shit rolls downhill. Your boss or your CTO won't be the one blamed for mistakes or hacks or data loss. It's all coming down on you. And 69% of all companies have had data loss in the last five years. So even with the best design, I mean, you can have bugs, hacks, bad admins, bad users. And I know cases where storage issues have led to death. And I don't mean an array falling on someone, just issues with systems going down and people have died because of it. And our best friend, CryptoLocker. Now, a lot of our issues do come from the inside. All the CryptoLocker issues I've had to deal with were because of employees, mostly executives or their staff. Now, when you think about it, 51% of all social engineering attacks like this are financially motivated. 14% of all attacks are revenge, your own people. In my customer environments, I'm typically more scared of who's on staff, because I know their experience and I know their attitudes, than I am of a random hacker. Now, we, when you also think about it, if just 1% of the US was stupid, that's 3.2 million stupid end users. It doesn't have to be a crisis, though. I mean, many disk arrays, they have things like snapshots, so you can instantly jump back an entire file system or a single file to any point in time where you have a snap of it. But many companies aren't running this or they might not have licensed the feature or they might not have enough storage to actually hold enough snapshots for a couple days or a couple weeks of, of local uh, retention. But there's ways to get around this. I've seen very few people actually run things like CryptoLocker or CryptoWall Defense. Now, the best defense in an attack is a good offense, cutting it off before it does damage. I mean, we have ways to detect the moment it writes out its first files and shutting them down or writing out its encryption key. And these are just a couple examples. This was like a response to a Reddit post that I did, and someone was asking about one certain disk array. I couldn't find anything for it that was easy, so I wrote a small script to do the same thing. So back up regularly, snapshot often, use tools like these, and Please educate your users and IT staff. I mean, education really is everything. This is every major term from the Storage Alliance's uh, dictionary. 
Now, many we might know, but many, most security people or most IT staff have no idea what they are. And when we think about what we might know, like a SAN, storage attached network, fiber channel, FCOE, iSCSI, this is when you present your storage up and it looks like a local disk. We have NAS. This is SMB or NFS. And this is when you have direct access to a file over a share or an export. The SAN also has direct access to that file. Your SAN or, or, or your NAS gets compromised. Someone can yank your files or do whatever they want with them directly. Now, new players like Object. This is really picking up steam. I have a lot of customers with petabytes of files, billions and billions of files. Now, how do you find the file that you need? How do you manage it? billions of files. It's a needle in a haystack. Now with Object, uh, this is like Swift or Amazon S3. When you put a file up there into the repository, you can attach with it metadata as part of the object, the, the value pairs. So you can search off of that or you can reference it or you can have your system automatically generate it. But some of the big concerns that security is definitely not looking into are the new players. Who here has worked with VMware's vSAN? A couple of you. What about hyperconverged platforms? Who's never heard the term hyperconverged? All right, 80% of you. So manufacturers, vendors, they want to make everything simple. Hyperconverged is when you have your compute, your storage, and your networking under one pane of glass, one update bundle, and basically one scalable system. This is how a lot of data centers are going now. But the problem is you're tied to either that vendor or issues they might have. One had a piece of proprietary hardware for write acceleration, but the drivers for it, they couldn't get it to work between vSphere 5.5 to 6.0, so customers couldn't update for two years. And there's a lot of players in the market. There's dozens and dozens of storage companies. Most of them, they have different storage platforms and products and proprietary applications to go along with every single one of them it really is hard to keep up. And this doesn't even include the homegrown solutions or the open source products. Now, I've met a lot of the executives and engineers through these, through like Tech Field Day or Storage Field Day, and some of them that I've talked to, they're doing a really good job with their security practices. Others, more than half, are not. Now, where do they play in the market? So, we see that a lot of them are, are in different spaces. And one update might add a new protocol or it might update new ports. We have to take a more vigilant look at actually what's being installed on our storage platforms and change our methodologies on how we're going to handle these updates or these additions. Now, what are some new trends in storage that keep me up at night? Number one, direct connecting storage to a cloud provider. This is getting incredibly popular. I'll speak more on this in a bit, but I do have some slides on it. Number two, directly connecting containers or running containers like Docker within your SAN. Nearly every major storage vendor in the next 18 months is going to be doing this. So imagine that, Docker in a container, and Docker stores beta so people can just download containers at their will with a click of a button and run them in your multi-million dollar SAN with all your corporate data. So some of these disk arrays, they have a terabyte of RAM and dozens of cores, and companies feel like, all right, when these are idle, we want to make use of them. But it's a huge security nightmare. And VMware. Companies like VMware are trying to shake up the industry. Uh, they put out vSAN, they put out a lot of stuff. They're putting out new features constantly, but they love embracing the past and not always in a good way. And a lot of companies use VMware. I mean, I love VMware. I've been using it since 1999, the first beta of Workstation. Now, they also make storage, they also make security a giant pain in the ass, and I'll touch on this a bit. So if you have a drink, now, what do you think the number one weakness in storage is? Shout out some answers. People, people accessing it. Maybe. They all run common operating systems. All of them. 
even Windows, everything. Common operating systems, OS-based exploits work against your SAN or your NAS. If you don't believe me, well, here we go. Arrays can cost millions of dollars, and the price doesn't always match a linear scale with how much security they have. I mean, this SAN is super fast, but it was susceptible to a zero day, just like any other Linux box. So the user account here was a read-only reporting user. Why could I sudo and why could I wget with a read-only reporting user? It's running Ubuntu. So your disk arrays are running web servers and app stacks. They have web APIs and they can get exploits. They had Heartbleed, Shellshock, and others. I mean, people want to do API access into their storage for automation. They want to do PowerShell against it. And this is an open door because everything is there from the OSs that we're testing in other fields. They're in our SAN. And these systems don't get updated quickly. This one manufacturer, they updated and patched within a month. Others took that long to just deny that they had a problem. <laughs> now I want to step back to something a little bit more basic. I do health checks all the time on, on customer data center environments. And here we see Obi-Wan poning the empire. I mean, there's no locks, passwords, or security. And what I find is sysadmins or storage admins never change the install passwords. They don't know what's going to break if they change anything. And sort of rightly so, they've probably been burnt before. And we're not making their jobs any easier. So if, they're not, if they are doing something like that, or let's say shared accounts, admin root or whatever, uh, don't do that. Make individual accounts for every purpose. But who here knew that most disk arrays can actually integrate with Active Directory, even if they're not serving up SMB for role-based access control? Now, I'd say 99% of the time, companies are giving domain admin uh, OU group full SAN access. Now, Bob might be a great desktop admin, but he's a storage idiot. Do not do that. Who's ever ran a storage benchmark? Ah, uh, quite a few of you, like Iometer, uh, VD Bench. Well, storage admins love to brag about the size of their disk. I mean, it's a clear indication of their insecurity. And I want to talk about a very popular new benchmark that every single um, vendor of, of uh, all flash arrays are really talking about and using. So it's called VD Bench, and it, it runs off of HCL Bench that Oracle makes. And it can be a good tool if used right. And I want to show you something. Tell me what's wrong with this picture. It wants your vCenter admin credentials because it's going to create a lot of worker VMs. Cleaning them up is optional. This is made by enterprise companies to test enterprise flash arrays that cost hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars. And it's making a lot of worker VMs. So this is just an example of many issues with virtual appliances as a whole, and storage manufacturers are a huge problem with this. So just looking deeper into this one, they took the liberty and they removed the firewall for us. So it's also running Postfix, Fuzzable, Java Web Services, gets its IPs automatically, uh, and you don't have to log into the console. Any VMware user, whether it be through the VI client or workstation, whatever, con connecting in, has root level access into X number of VMs in a customer's environment. So to me, that's the perfect Meterpreter pivot point. I mean, we're giving them an open door, and this is never put into change control. This is never given to security that you're about to do this. And companies are using virtual appliances everywhere, almost every single Storage manufacturer has at least one, be it monitoring or phoning, homing, system management. VMware has their VASA providers, which is vStorage API or uh, vStorage APIs for storage awareness, uh, backup VMs. So who audits these? I mean, I don't know, but coming with Docker soon in all SAN and the Docker Docker store, it's going to get even worse. So I gave a talk like this at a university at a conference, and I just grabbed a random LinkedIn profile by a random admin at their, at their university. I know everything they run now. I know versions that they run. 
I know their storage, and I know exactly how I can get into their environment and trickle out every bit of data they have. So be care of what you're telling the public. Now, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about the cloud. So the cloud is sort of like having Lando as a best friend. It's a blessing and a curse. And I'm going to talk about one instance of this that people might not think is storage security, but at its heart, it really is. Code spaces. Who's heard of code spaces? They were an online repository a lot like GitHub. And one night, they were DDoSed. It lasted about 12 hours, long enough for the, the hacker or exploiter to get in and delete every single snapshot they had, every backup in S, Amazon S3, every block store, every single VM. So in 12 hours, this multi-million dollar company was put out of business overnight. And that is entirely a storage issue. Why? Everything was under one roof, one API key, one console. They had no immutable backups or no backups outside of the cloud provider that they were using. If they did, this business would still be around. Now, I mentioned cloud-connected storage. So you can get a 1 to 10 gig link to AWS or Azure for pretty cheap. And latencies are really good. So a lot of customers, they're putting a SAN, either virtual in the cloud or at a shared provider and cross-connecting up. And they're maybe bursting to the cloud providers for compute, or they're doing replication between their sites this way. It is actually really awesome. Imagine something like an Oracle Rack or a SQL cluster between Azure and AWS or Rackspace. You have cloud fault tolerance because you have centralized storage between multiple cloud providers. So this can be incredibly useful if it's protected right. If it's not protected right, it's an open door into a storage network in your headquarters or the colo. And tapes, they're not going anywhere. I have customers that some of them have more than a 100-year retention time, especially in biotech or medical, where you have to keep records for life of your patient and then some. Financial has similar things with mortgages. So it actually is really easy to protect them. It's easy to encrypt. Most have it on board if you just enable it. But why do we hear so many issues? And then why aren't we hearing much about sand layer being stolen? And we don't know very well how to monitor it. We don't audit it. It's so much data that we're, we're not CSI. So storage auditing is really a forgotten about practice. If you go in and review command history or, or review every open file, and nine times out of 10, monitoring tools are the first thing to get cut out of a budget. If middle management doesn't see a profit gain from a purchase, they're not going to fight it at the upper executives to actually try to get something to make their team have a better life or do their job better. And on the topic of encryption, I don't know if you know the story, but the rebels stole a satellite and they listened in and the Death Star plans were sent unencrypted. Now you wouldn't think they'd make that mistake, but what I see is sort of like a state of the storage industry encryption adoption. I have a a lot of people that I've talked to that they don't know what encryption is. So when you think about it, how many mom and pops do you know that might have grown organically or other small business? They don't know about encryption. Hell, Home Depot said, we sell hammers. What do we know about protecting credit card data? And that's Home Depot. So this is more prevalent than you might think. Or customers that are like, well, encryption is too expensive. And if they don't have a compliance reason to to buy encrypted hardware, they're not going to do it. Price is the ultimate motivator. Now, companies that might have to encrypt because of regulatory compliances will do the bare minimum typically. I have one that they encrypted one column in one table in one database instead of paying maybe 30% more and buying an entire encrypted disk array. That's happening. So price is a big motivator. Now, luckily, many all-flash arrays and newer storage arrays are encrypting out of the box, either with like AES-256 or self-encrypting disks. Now, life of storage is really long, so this might be a few years out before people even go ahead and do this in their refresh. And absolutely no one encrypts in flight and at rest end-to-end -end through all their tiers. Believe me, I've tried to sell it, they won't buy it. 
Now, who here has storage from maybe at least one of the platforms up there? Quite a few. Now, you'll see even within the same companies, how they're doing encryption is much different between all their different platforms. And this adds complexity, which reduces security. And we have to be very careful about encryption on the cheap, because if you remember things like TrueCrypt, who's auditing it? So please, in your next refresh cycles, think about encryption of your storage. Now, delving deeper into the protocols, we have like NFS version three. This was put out in 1995. That was the year Kevin Mitnick was arrested, Microsoft Bob was released, and Hackers was in the movie theaters. We're running a protocol older than many of the people running this conference. NFS3 is not for security. And even VMware says it that, well, just segment it off because we're not going to secure it for you. So we have a new protocol, 4.1. They finally added Kerberos support, but that was released in 1993, that cipher. Windows 7 won't even use that cipher, it was blocked. And it's not supported with most of their other products. Or SMB and SIFs. We are absolutely screwed no matter what. So most people think that attacks are front side from the end user, but protection has to come from the back end. If you are doing things like SMB2 or message signing, most SAN will actually downgrade that if they see an issue in the protocol, down to SMB1. Or if you're in a multi-site enterprise and using WAN accelerators, the WAN accelerators will downgrade that from two to one if they see a protocol issue. So it really is time to upgrade. I mean, a lot of you might hate it, but Windows 10 or 2012 R2 supports SMB3, which is actually pretty good. It can be encrypted. It can be much more safer than anything we've had before. Now, as far as the SAN itself, it's not uncommon to see Brocade or Cisco MDSs with five to six year old firmware. It's actually very common. Or systems not being updated except for maybe once a year or after three years when they refresh out to new hardware. Now customers feel if it's not broke, for the love of God, don't fix it. We have to live and die by the vendor's compatibility matrix, and this leads to stale versions and exploitable systems. And even the bare, bin bare minimum thing like zoning, people half-ass it because they don't understand it. So single initiator, single target zoning with WWNs, that means only this one adapter can talk to this one on the SAN, and people usually don't do that. Or if you do run the management firmware with the drivers, this opens up uh, RPC, uh, web ports, and many other things. So if I have this and I'm on a network that someone just used defaults, I can upload whatever firmware I want to their HBAs or take out the ports. Now, iSCSI. Oh, people say, well, you can use iSCSI off, like CHAP. Very few, but I can box reveal it on any system you have CHAP enabled on. So it's not actually very secure, and I've seen this done in an environment by a non-IT staff, and the password used was the Windows domain admin password. <laughs> so, and sort of to finish up a little bit, we see a lot of vendors removing uh, security information from their documentation about what is the best way to harden a system. So we really have to, uh, we have to implore to the vendors that they must make security a focus and not an insane cost addition. And then also, backup, backup, backup. If you don't have three different types, I mean online like snapshots, near line like replication, and offline meaning a, an immutable backup, tape or whatever. I know a lot of people hate tape, but it's the easy way to describe what an immutable backup is. You must be doing that. So thank you for coming, it's great to be here. Uh, not a lot of time for questions, but if you see me anywhere at the conference, uh, hit me up with whatever questions you have or hit me up on Twitter because I can talk for days about this. So this, uh, oh, so far. Go ahead. Before we go to questions, I just want to remind everyone that uh, this track is being recorded. So if you can use the mic at the front or I can uh, run a mic to you. So let's start questions. Anyone? All right, let's get, give the speaker another round of applause.